In this video, we are going to take the analogy of car manufacturing to understand the idea of pipelining a little further. A quick recap of the process that we envision for manufacturing cars. We have containers that have frames, wheels, doors, engines, and steering wheels. And the technician who needs to assemble the car needs to select one of each of these and put them together. In the process, of course, the technician needs to individually visit each of the containers where the components are placed, come back to the workstation and assemble it there. If we have more than one technician capable of performing these operations, then we could end up with a situation where each of them works at a different speed. And we could also potentially have clashes where more than one of them is trying to access the same resource at the same time. The alternative that we envisioned for this was a moving belt and technicians placed at specific locations along the belt with each technician having a very specific job. The first would take the frames and assemble them. The second would add the wheels. The third would add the doors, then the engines. And finally, the last technician would add the steering wheels to create a fully constructed car. This was what we said was the assembly line or the pipeline mode of manufacture. And the moving belt is essentially the assembly line that allows us to construct things in a streamlined fashion. The analogy, of course, was to understand how instructions in a processor can also be processed the same way. We will get to that in a future video. For the time being, we are going to continue using the analogy of car manufacture in order to understand what the limitations on speed and constraints on the resources are that we need to consider. Let's assume that each of these steps takes a certain amount of time. For example, we assume that constructing a frame requires three hours of work. Assembling the wheels requires two hours. Attaching the doors requires one hour. Attaching the engine requires two hours. And finally, attaching the steering wheel requires one hour of work. We will leave aside for the moment differences in working time between different technicians and assume that these are fixed numbers with which our pipeline is going to work. Based on this, what we can see is that the total time required to assemble a car is going to be nine hours. In other words, just the sum of the times required for each of the individual components. If a single worker is assembling a car, he will of course take three hours to assemble the frame, then two hours for the wheels, one for the door, two for the engine, one for the steering wheel, and finish one car within nine hours, at which point he can start work on the next car, and at the 18 hour mark would have constructed two complete cars. An alternative, which I'll call the as soon as possible approach over here, is that one technician essentially starts assembling the frames. He works from time zero to three. As soon as he is done with that, the same technician then takes over and starts working on the frame corresponding to car two. While in the meantime, another technician starts working on assembling the wheels for car one. As soon as the second technician is done with the wheels for car one, he can pass on the car so that the third technician can start assembling the door. However, the second technician cannot yet start working on car two because the first technician is not done yet. He'll have to in fact wait until the first technician has completed assembling the frame for car two before the second technician can start on the wheels for car two. In other words, the second technician is going to be idle for a certain amount of time. Now this, in fact, is pretty much how a normal pipeline or an assembly line would work. There's only one catch over here when we consider the analogy with instructions, which is that the starting times of all the tasks are not synchronized with each other. The second technician starts at multiples of three, that is at time three, six, nine, and so on. Whereas the third technician starts his first task at time five, the second at time eight, the third at time 11, and so on. Although this is not necessarily a major problem, especially from the point of view of assembling a car, when we are trying to construct a CPU and pipeline its instruction execution, 
we do not want this kind of out of sync behavior. Instead, what we do is to construct an explicit pipeline where we think in terms of cycles of work. The first cycle is given the time from zero to three, the second cycle from three to six, the third from six to nine, and so on. In this way, we can clearly assign tasks. Technician one needs to work on car one during cycle one. The same technician then moves on to car two in cycle two, and then to car three in cycle three. Technician two, on the other hand, works on car one in cycle two, and then moves on to car two in cycle three and car three in cycle four and so on. He does not really need to know exactly when technician one finished. He just knows that at the start of a cycle, there will be a car ready for him to start attaching wheels to. The same way the third technician can just start at the beginning of each cycle and attach doors to the car that is in front of him. In this way, all the jobs are synchronized to cycle boundaries. The one drawback of this approach, as you might notice, if you compare this with the previous, was that although in the previous case, one car was completed at time nine, which was the total time required for all the execution, over here, the car is only completed at time 13, or strictly speaking, in cycle five, which completes at time 15. In other words, the time required to produce a single individual car has increased. On the other hand, you will find that the throughput in this case is exactly the same as it was in the assembly line case, which is that the bottleneck over here is set by the frame assembly, which takes three hours. And therefore, once every cycle or once every three hours, we will produce a car. In the steady state operation, we will actually find that once every cycle, one car gets produced. In other words, there is one car being generated out of the assembly line every three hours. A question that we can ask over here is, are all the workstations being used efficiently? And what we mean by efficiency is, a workstation is capable of doing a certain amount of work. Is it being used for the entire amount of time in a reasonable manner? If we look at the previous diagram, we'll see that the total time required to complete a car is three times five cycles, which is 15 hours whereas the actual busy work was only nine hours, which is the sum of the times required for the individual components to be assembled. Effectively, this tells us that the utilization, in other words, is about 60%, nine over 15 hours. For each individual station, what we can see is that for the frame assembly, the frame assembly is always busy. It is always working for the complete cycle of three hours. And as soon as one cycle is over, the frame assembly starts on the next cycle and therefore is always kept busy. In other words, it has a 100% station utilization. The wheels, on the other hand, work for only two out of every three hours for a utilization of 67%. The door assembly is even less. It's only one out of three hours or 33%. Similarly, for the engines, 67% and for the steering wheel at 33%. When we take the weighted average of all of these, we find that the overall utilization of all stations or the entire hardware available in the system put together comes out to be 60%. A natural question would be, how do we reduce wastage over here? And one possible suggestion is, since the frame assembly was the only one that took three hours, could we do something about it? One possibility is we could split F frame assembly into two stages, we'll call them F1 and F2. In this way, we assume that F1, let's say takes two hours and F2 takes one hour for a total of the same three hours as it was earlier. In fact, even if it was a little more than three hours, it does not matter because we have some extra leeway here. We have a total of four hours now to work with, even if we reduce the cycle time to two hours. So what has happened now, we have reduced the cycle time to two hours, which is the maximum of any individual stage. And what we can find is F1 and F2 combined take two cycles, but each of the other stages, wheels, doors, engine, and steering wheel, take only one stage each for a total number of stages of six. With a cycle time of two hours, this means that the total time to manufacture a car is 12 hours, of which we know that nine are the actual busy work. 
this means that we have an overall utilization of 75%. It has increased from the 60% that we had earlier. More importantly, we also have a higher throughput. We can now generate one car every two hours in the steady state. What's the penalty that we pay for this? We require an extra workstation. F1 and F2 need to be capable of working on two separate cars at any given point in time, which means that the frame assembly would require two people to work on it or two workstations where the frame is being assembled. Of course, each of the workstations works only on part of the frame. So in other words, what we have done is we have traded off a little bit of extra hardware, but in return, we have got a higher throughput and better utilization efficiency. So from this discussion, we can see that there is something that we can imagine is a balanced pipeline where every step takes exactly the same duration and every workstation is at 100% utilization. That would be the ideal situation. And in fact, we could consider breaking up each of the individual stages into one hour cycles so that, for example, wheel assembly, which would normally take two hours, is split up into two parts. And frame assembly, which takes three hours, would be split up into three parts. In this way, we would have nine workstations, but each of those workstations could then potentially be working at a precise 100% utilization. And we get not only the best possible latency, in other words, nine hours to generate one car, we also get the best possible throughput, that is to say, one car every hour. The drawback, of course, is extra hardware. We now need nine pieces or nine workstations that are capable of working on the different parts of the car assembly. Now, this is where our analogy sort of comes to an end. All the steps that have been discussed so far do make sense in the context of processors. However, a very important difference is the fact that there can be branching. In other words, we may need to change the control flow. We may need to start fetching instructions from a new location and executing them, which potentially has the impact that instructions that are already in the pipeline either need to be eliminated, or we need to wait until they complete before we start the new instruction, or we may actually have to wait before even branching in order to find out where we need to go next. All of these can have a negative impact on the overall throughput of the pipeline. And therefore, the final design of the computer architecture becomes a balance between the desired throughput and the penalty that we are willing to pay whenever we have branching and penalties on the pipeline. We will look into these issues in the next lectures.